All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, we're here as part of the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. Uh, truly extraordinary times being uh, from Washington, D.C. I can certainly underline it. Um, but what we're going to be talking about, of course, is uh, a central bank approach. To you know, I want to go back a little bit to the great financial crisis of 2008, because I think the issue of greater central bank enrollment started back then. Um, and we had similar problems then as we are facing today in that uh, there was complete monetary accommodation while the fiscal side of the story was kind of new. Um, Euro countries obviously had to deal with a percentage of debt to GDP or deficit to GDP. Uh, there's, there was reluctance from other countries to do fiscal expansion, and, um, especially the United States. Uh, during the Obama presidency, there was a lot of partisanship. We're very united now, if you don't know. Um, but uh, the problems have started then, and some people look at this problem and say, that's actually not a problem. They were trying to solve something. And yes, they have managed to uh, correct certain things, um, maybe made the recession shorter at that time. But we are now facing a completely different ballgame, uh, the likes of which we have not seen before with the pandemic. And it was the Federal Reserve, again, who came to bat, and then other central banks to provide liquidity to the markets. So the question becomes, and then there was actually a fiscal response from, from some countries, including the U.S. And initially, uh, the two parties came together and provided some level of stimulus, which they knew without them would be in, in trouble on election time. But we don't have enough fiscal support. Uh, Jay Powell would tell you that himself if he were here. Uh, he's a very subtle speaker, but uh, he gets the message across. He's asking the Congress, he's asking every developed country to contribute fiscally. So the question becomes, we're in this situation where we're injecting cash, left and right, buying homes, left and right. Have we done too much? Have we done too much or is that the right approach? And if we've done too much, how do we actually manage to, to put back and get to a normal level. Because if you look at the Federal Reserve uh, meeting from last week, when people uh, criticized the Federal Reserve for doing nothing, meaning introducing additional stimulus measures, I think they have done a lot by just staying put. Because they sent a message. And that message was, we're not raising interest rates, probably going on until 2023. So here's where we are. Uh, has this worked? Has this uh, caused problems with the balance of things? And if it has, what do we do from this point on? And I'm going to pass it on to Mark at this point, Bart. We know you, but uh, just introduce yourself briefly and, and uh, go at it. Uh, th thank you uh, very much uh, for, this, uh, for this wonderful introduction. I'm Bart Turtleboom. I'm the chairman of Delphus International an advisory firm based in Washington, D.C. that helps raise funding for banks and corporates in emerging markets from development uh, finance institutions uh, globally. To pick up on, uh, on, on the points you have just made and sticking to, to, to the time limit that I have here, I'd like to make just a couple of, uh, of, of broad brush macro observations to, to help set the stage. The first and most important one is um, in the first quarter of this year and the second quarter of this year, the level of GDP in a whole bunch of countries in the G7 has been set back between 10 and 20 years in one or two quarters. So the move is truly unprecedented. And the reason I mentioned that is not just the size of the move, but uh, which is the largest since historical records started, but more importantly, the absolute speed with which that happened. So we're in a world of massive unknown unknowns, and we have seen uh, primarily uh, a, a central bank response led by the ECB in Europe and uh, the, the Federal Reserve in the US. They've injected vast amounts of money. But the challenge that they are facing in doing that is that the the manner in which they have injected funds is is per definition targeted at the average borrower and lender and saver of uh, uh, of the country in which they are deploying it 
So when the Federal Reserve says we're going to buy ETFs that hold investment grade bonds, that puts clearly a cap on how much investment grade spreads can widen in the United States. But it's indiscriminate across all the credits in the indices. So what we're facing here is is an, a monetary policy response, which was absolutely required, but which is very uneven in its impact on uh, various sectors and industries in the economy. And to just give you guys an example of that, uh, when the Fed announced this program, Oracle immediately borrowed $20 billion across all maturities and currencies that they could get their hands on. Now, clearly, Oracle doesn't really need the money. Who needs the money is the airlines, is the cruise liners, is the nonprofit sector, the the educational sector. So the Fed can very well pump 20% of GDP in the economy, but that is not going to prevent 20% of U.S. university to go bankrupt over the next two years. So the corollary of that is, and then I stop, the corollary of that is that on the way out of this, the the this, the distributional impact across countries and within a country is going to be absolutely as massive as on the way in and is going to pose very significant social domestic political and geopolitical tensions so i'll i'll stop here for now hey you're on mute you're on mute saruha You, you've done it in two minutes and 59 seconds. That's amazing. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> but thank you very much. And uh, I think the, the, the point that uh, the, the summary here is that the unevenness of, of what is going on. And with that, I want to pass it on to, to Russell because you're going to give Russell the, the bank's perspective into, as to what is happening. And um, please introduce yourself again and then um, you can get started. Oh, good, good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, so I'm Russell Saunders. I uh, run all the global payments infrastructure for Lloyd's Banking Group uh, in the UK. Um, but I'm also on the board of SWIFT, the, the global um, payments company, and the board of Pay UK, which is the UK's uh, domestic payments infrastructure, and the board of uh, the Chaps Co., which is uh, the Bank of England's RTGS solution. Um, Uh, very interesting comments so far. Uh, I mean, I was reflecting on what part of the exam question, which is around austerity, too much, none at all. Um, but if we look back to the previous global financial crisis, um, that has been hanging around the necks of the banks ever since. Um, there's been up, up, some upsides of the interventions globally uh, by, the, by the regulators. Um, but when we should have been growing and collaborating and tackling you know, problems of the, of the planet. We've been held back by austerity in the UK and Europe. And geopolitics continue to play out, which is disconnecting the world uh, when global payments infrastructure should be connecting the world up um, to, to support financial growth and, 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 and trade. Um, more positively, because of the corrections that the regulators took for the global banking systems uh, post-2012, the balance sheets of all banks have been right-sized. You know, their core tier one ratios during the crisis were probably one to one and a half percent, at best three. Mostly they're now 12 to 14 percent. So the response of the, <clears throat> the banks to support economies during this horrific downturn is more able, more able to be sustainable. Um, and although the market cap of, in the UK, I can talk, I can talk more about the UK, the market cap, cap, capital of uh, the big banks has halved in the last six months, which is horrific when you think about the, uh, you know, the, the, the long-term shareholder return and all of the other uh, key metrics. Um, I mean, in, if it's on some of the numbers that I've researched, uh, U.S. banks alone expect to write off $320 billion dollars in 2020. Uh, the bad, bad debt rates are expected to be twice that of the global financial crisis. And some forecasts put private and public debt could reach $230 trillion dollars by the end of the year. 
and, and these numbers are staggering. And if the banks respond to those numbers in a traditional way, then it would force them to right size their balance sheets. It would force them to uh, draw back on lending and pull back any marginal or high risk loans. And if that was to happen, then the, the, the consequences would be catastrophic. We would have the, the medical catastrophe would become another banking catastrophe. And, and we just really have to avoid that. Um, some of the things in my view that may be uh, key to avoid avoiding that behavior, uh, the central banks need to give balance sheet relief to the, the global banks and, the, and some of the challenger banks um, so they can uh, reduce their core tier one ratio, ratios um, to, to a, a level that would enable them to lend more freely. Um, investment in uh, systemically important institutions and infrastructure is absolutely key and not necessarily some of the, the 15, 20 year in, uh, investments, but those that can create a return in, in within five years. Uh, government should enable, and this is particularly relevant in the UK, the neo banks, the all digital banks that is, and the challenger banks are almost frozen out of the recovery money. Um, all of the, the big banks will lend in government bank schemes, uh, they're billions every day. But the challenger banks, whose technology are better able to get the money to where it's needed more quickly, were frozen out of the first wave. So that's a really important uh, change that we need to see. Uh, and I suspect this is globally uh, with regulators trusting the start of the challenger banks to do more uh, for SMEs in, in particular. Uh, and we really do have to protect uh, critical health infrastructures. Um, we need to look at how we can free up the intergenerational wealth challenge, where certain parts of the population have huge amounts of wealth tied up in pensions. And, and that can't yet, particularly in the UK, is not able to be used to, to support some of these uh, initiatives I've talked about. Um, and finally, the, the, in, it, it's perhaps a more personal view, there has been certain sectors which have benefited hugely in the financial sector um, from the pandemic. Uh, and that can't be right that they have benefited so much when others have suffered so much. So there should be some interventions in the tax regime um, which can perhaps address some of the inequalities. So I suppose I argue that whereas in the great financial crisis, the banks were the architects of it, in this crisis, the banks can be part of the solution. And if they're given more permissions, then they should be held to account for delivering on those, those commitments. I just hope in 10 years time, when we look back on what we've achieved and, we, and what the new normal looks like, we can, we can look back and be proud of what the banking sector has done to support uh, the global transition. Thank you very much for that. Indeed, uh, the, what, what the banks have have, have gone through uh, this time period uh, versus 2008, that was a stark picture of how, how different it was in terms of the response to the crisis and where they were in 2008 versus now. So thank you for that. So far, we've talked about the monetary aspect of it. We talked about central bank injection. We talked about private banks. Um, but what about the fiscal part of it? What is the responsibility for the governments, what are they doing? Are they doing enough, or should they be doing more? And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Winston because um, you're going to touch up on that fiscal perspective, Winston. Hi, this is Winston. I retired from private equity, and I now write a column at the uh, South China Morning Post. Uh, I'd like to discuss the f fiscal aspects a bit more internationally. First, by you know, going through you know, four drivers of what may you know, shape or constrain the ability for different governments to respond effectively to the economic shocks of COVID-19. I think the first um, and most obvious is public debt. When you compare a highly indebted country like Japan, where the national debt is significantly higher than 200% of GDP, 
with Germany, which is you now a highly prudent country. You now until 2014, it is running a fiscal a surplus, where its national debt is only you know on a gross basis is only 60 percent and, and of course uh, lower on a net basis. The second driver is national savings. If you contrast, uh, given a range of structural factors driving the high national savings of China, 47% versus a quite low national savings of 17% in the US. But if you actually dig down you know, belong, uh, beyond the gross national savings data of the US, there's a wide disparity between the haves and have-nots. If you look at the you know, average people in the US, the, the savings pictures are actually um, much more um, difficult, much more challenging. The third is uh, national assets, not so much the quantity as the uh, quality. So if you look at a national asset of energy producing country like Saudi Arabia tied up in Aramco, its national asset is highly tied to oil prices. Rest, now, in a case like Singapore or China, which have a much more diversified base of even government-linked companies or state-owned companies over a wide range of sectors, uh, they are affected by the uh, COVID-19 differently. And finally, um, to look at um, uh, fiscal issues you now beyond just a national level, at both a, a supranational level, you have been an example where you now um, highly indebted countries like uh, Italy, uh, Greece, and to less extent Spain could be bailed out by EU overall with the big you know, 750 billion euro rescue package. Or at a subnational level where in China there's great dynamics between the central government and local governments and res the respective uh, roles of funding. Uh, different aspects of uh, economic activities, investments, social obligations. We don't have time to you know, dwell you know, uh, in the details as to how that you know, national versus local provincial dynamics will play out in China. And finally, of course, going back to the U.S., uh, the inter-party dynamics uh, between uh, heroes sponsored by Democrats versus Hughes by um but Republicans, there's a, like a, a $2 billion, $2 billion gap, $2 trillion gap between those two. And, and now the, uh, two, and now the Democrats has you know, reduced the price tax significantly. And, and there may be a deal between Pelosi and Mucin. And finally, you no, know, as we look at all these factors, um, which are you no, know, either for developed countries or middle income countries, we shouldn't overlook the challenges of really poor countries, particularly Africa, where they really need, um, a sh a sh there's a shortfall of $7.5 billion to take care of this, you know, sustain its economy. Otherwise, a lot of people would die from either diseases or salvation. So I think that's uh, uh, you know, an area that we shouldn't overlook you know, as we just focus on the uh, developed world. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, and thank you for bringing up um, Africa, because a lot of the times in this discussion or discussions such as these, we focus on so much on the macro issue and developed countries, but uh, there are regions that have been hit harder than others, um, and Africa is definitely one of them, and thank you for that. Regarding the U.S. Uh, talks that are ongoing, I can tell you we're very excited because they're talking to one another. That's where we are right now in the United States. Uh, CNBC had a huge segment on it yesterday, and it started with, they're talking again. This is wonderful. Um, but uh, I don't think, hopefully, they'll come to an agreement, but uh, I don't see that happening before the elections. But thank you so much on the fiscal fiscal approach, fiscal component of it. And I'm um, very happy to introduce James here at this point, because while we're talking about the fiscal portion of it, uh, here is a specific micro example uh, that James is going to talk to us. And then I'll open up to uh, to our uh, audience as well. We had 10, now we have seven. I'm sure uh, you have interesting things to contribute. And then um, we'll have 20 minutes or so left after that. But James, go ahead, please. 
Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry, Winston, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. It's a bit of news. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is James Martin. I am Chief Executive at the Astana Interfinancial Center in Kazakhstan in Nur Sultana, capital city here. Um, what I want to talk about is basically the sort of next level down is what are we trying to do in order to weather the economic crisis and put it into execution, if you will. So it's very much the case that if we take our example here, understandably, the governments, the ministries were very much initially focusing on the two key aspects of healthcare and stabilization. And that's very much, as you understand and listening to my esteemed uh, panelists talking about before, these are the stabilization uh, packages that people got put in. And it's very much around getting the wealth, as Bart mentioned, to the right people. That's been very much a key focus. But from a financial center perspective, what we've been trying to do is when the government was ready, we would be seeing how we would restart the economy. So more about stimulus versus stabilization. And then it's very much a key that in, in Kazakhstan, we are obviously blessed by a strong fiscal, uh, fiscal standing that we have. We've just had uh, Moody's and Fitch, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, reconfirm uh, our ratings, which is very good. But a lot of that was built off the blessings and the benefits of the oil prices in the past. And obviously, where our GDP is still very much dominated by the oil and extraction uh, industries, but we've been very much over the past few years looking to diversify along, as, as Winston mentioned, with the likes of Saudi Arabian economy. So what we've been looking to do here was very much about seeing how that we could increase the, the, the uh, GDP influence and contribution from the other sectors. And that's very much a role we have as a financial center our role is to assist the government in attracting FDI, direct deployed capital, into the Kazakh economy. And very much so the question is, as we've come out to restart the economy, it's we have obviously pension fund, oil funds, but the question is how do we utilize the strong economy that we have? And obviously it's a question of how do we involve and attract the foreign direct investment? So as Bart again mentioned, there are historical firsts that we've never seen the likes of the exodus of the capital, leaving so much emerging in frontier markets. So how do we as an economy try and bring that money back? We have very much SMEs as a focus of the OECD. I believe around 65% of the economies have contributed to SMEs. In Kazakhstan, we're only operating around 28%. So this is very much key for us, the job creation goals. So it's trying to not lose this impetus that we had before. But what I do think the benefit that we've had from this pandemic is being able for us to refocus, refocus to have a much more integrated uh, window for economies and for investors to be able to come in and invest in the economy. And that's the role of the financial center to create a de-risking platform for uh, real money to come into where it's needed in the economy. So that could involve de-risking through using the our financial center at English common law jurisdiction, but you can invest onshore. It enables people to co-invest with the government, the government ministries and our investment funds, and also with the likes of the supranationals. So the idea is that we're able to create much more along the lines of accelerating, I believe, the private-public partnership schemes, which is enabling the money to get to the right economy, and also for the government to be able to use the, the funding wisely to get it where it's needed. Thank you very much for that, James. These are, um, again, very different uh, perspectives, very different approaches to, to what we have been, uh, what we have witnessed over the, over the past seven, eight months. Uh, but I want to open up to the audience. I want to um, ask you if you have direct questions or comments that you want to make about um, uh, the, the austerity versus plenty argument and uh, whether fiscally we can do more, uh, whether in monetary terms we have done, done a lot and maybe we just need to take uh, and cool it down a little bit. Um, so please feel free to to jump in, and uh, you can make a comment and address a question to one of the panelists.
If not, then I'm going to ask some questions. I do see... Uh, Okay, there's no hand function here, but you can jump in any time. So I want to uh, go back to to um, Russell's comment about about banks, how they are different now than than in 2008. And I want to ask him, Russell, what would happen, or what would have happened if this pandemic hit during that time period? Would the mon monetary um, impact or, or stimulus still be able to help and kind of resolve the problem or it would be completely devastating? Well, I, th I think it, the devastation would have been um, unmanageable. Um, I, I, in the UK, uh, we had a, a run on nearly all the banks, um, government bailouts of RBS, which was a global bank in those days, uh, and my own bank, uh, we were uh, obliged or encouraged to acquire uh, the, the uh, Halifax um, Bank of Scotland, which was um, the third biggest domestic bank at the time. And then that, because of that hit on Lloyd's, we were then 35% uh, owned by the, by the government by the end of the first year of the crisis. Um, the number of building societies went to the wall. So and, and that's the scale of today. Uh, the, the pandemic consequences added on to the financial instability in 2008. Uh, I think we would have seen probably through Europe, all banks nationalized. I think the, the states had a slightly a different approach. Um, you, you'll be, I know more about that than me, but that was more, but more of a lending approach um, without taking uh, at direct control and generally direct control of, of banks is not a good thing in my view government control of banks thank you for that any any comments uh, on on how, how the response was or would have been back then um, because I also want to bring the issue of negative interest rates that has completely thrown the economies um, monetary economy, if you will, of balance. We're talking about fixed income investment. Um, and uh, we're talking about negative interest rates now in the United States, even though Federal Reserve Chairman strictly denies that, uh, that it will not happen. Um, but with the rates so low. Uh, so do you think, uh, and this is an open question to the panel, do you think that the negative interest rate component of it is something that we need to be worried about because the balance is thrown off so massively? Look, per perhaps I can chime in here. Negative interest rates are is another one of those unknown unknowns, particularly if you have them across the world everywhere, right? We don't really know because conceptually, um, if you get paid to take on debt, a fixed income instrument actually ceases to become a fixed income instrument and, and, and actually becomes a, a starts having equity like characteristics, right? If, if I can take out a mortgage and I'll make it extreme to set the straw man and I get paid 5% a year to take out the mortgage. Well, you know what? Well, what I'm going to do? I'm, it's, it's, it's clearly no longer a liability. Um, it's, it, it's something completely different, right? So we don't, we don't really know what that is going to mean, except that it's going to lead to something, a trend that clearly has already been going on for the past 15 years, that is a total lack of safe assets in the world, the global financial system, right? I mean, once that is the case, it's going to exacerbate that. My suspicion is, coming back to Russell's point earlier on, um, if we were to see some alleviation of the capital requirements for banks to allow them to lend more, uh, I think that's clearly going to be a very good thing. Um, if that were to happen, but I'm just afraid that it's going to steer more of that bank lending against more asset backed type instruments, right? So, you know, uh, you, you see it already in continental Europe. In, in my home country, Belgium, house prices are going up by, you know, between one and 3% a month. And, and, and it's obvious why. I mean, uh, rates are zero and it's a country with a 10% of GDP. 
phys- uh, private sector savings surplus and 10% of GDP balance of payment surplus. So what, what every month they need to put in half a percent of GDP into something and they're no longer buying government debt. So guess what? It's real estate. And it's no longer, it's also no longer houses in Thailand because of the pandemic. So, you know, we're in a, we're, in, we're in a very strange world on that. Should we be worried about it? We should absolutely be worried about it because it's going to exacerbate the trends that everybody identified here, more inequality across countries, within countries, across sectors, and these type of things. And, and that's clearly the last thing we need to come up with, a medium-term sustainable policy response. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? I mean, the real, real estate issue is a fascinating one because we're seeing this this price appreciation not only in developed markets but also developing markets. Now, Winston, maybe you can say something about China, uh, James, uh, in Kazakhstan, and in, in emerging markets in general too. If you'd like to make a comment, well, um, may, maybe not not in China, maybe you know in. Australia, where you know um, you have one of the most you know, overvalued um, real estate markets in the world, you know, comparable to well, the 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 the, the overvalued real estate markets in the world include Hong Kong, uh, Canada, Australia, a parts of Canada like Vancouver, and you know, despite the fact that you know, you have um, um, looming economic recession in in Australia, you still see you know. Houses being auctioned off at rapid prices, and and of course low interest rates has has part to do with it. Um, so the of course the other um, drivers, you no know, driving, you no know, real estate prices in China could be in, in parts of China it could be you know, currency uh, undervaluation um, that uh, would would in, inflate. Uh, prices, but there's another dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I would say is that if I if I look about talking to the buy side, then what I've noticed, especially coming from Asia and Middle Eastern capital pools, is obviously the the affection and long term love of they have from physical real estate is obviously it has been there, but it's actually I believe picked up in the last six months. I would say, especially when it comes to commercial. Um, and perhaps student uh, bill to bill to bill to uh, rent out uh, with the especially in uh, in Central Asia when we have the demography of a lot of the young kids looking to go to students universities so that opportunity as well as governments who are obviously committing to increase healthcare healthcare facilities I think are very big uh, increasing of schools in Kazakhstan for instance we have a large push to go from rural uh, to cities to get people into the urban so we have those commitments already to fulfil. But I would say definitely that the buy side are looking at the real estate a lot much more. The tangible, I think, again, to Bart's point, because the financial instruments, you know, we were sort of getting over the, the previous global crisis. And now that the fixed income equity, I mean, it, it's just all grayed out now. We have no go to safe financial instruments that people are seeing now. There is also, I totally agree, the risk that we're pushing towards more asset backed securities again. So in a way, we're pushing ourselves back to where we were before. And then to Russell's point, the question is how we can use the banks instead of being the culprit. This time, there's the chance for the banks to step up if they're actually, you know, dealt with accordingly to use them as a facilitation tool in order to get lending to the right place. The problem is at the same time, if we have requirements in the banks for capital adequacy, etc., how are they going to lend when they have to fix their own balance sheets uh, in order to facilitate their shareholders and their own risk mitigation and then get the money out to the, uh, to the underlying people that really need it. I think that's a fine balance when it comes to the, uh, the central bank's ruling. But with us, definitely, we do see another interest in real estate coming together. If I can just um, add a quick comment that of course, Chinese real estate investors have been a key driver in the global real estate scene way beyond China. So in place like Australia, Canada, London, parts of the U.S. But now because of you know, strict capital restriction and because of you know, COVID-19 and because of uh, geopolitics, so a lot of these Chinese uh, risk investors are pulling back from overseas investments. So, and and uh, these money have nowhere to go. So 
so this money may may you know cost another flush of uh, in due cost uh, a speculation in China. But in China, it, it's not a free market. There's a tremendous control in China. So let's say in Beijing, unless you have you are either resident of Beijing, you have a job here, been paying tax for three years, you you, you cannot buy a real estate. You cannot buy a property in Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen or Guangzhou. Otherwise, the price will be much higher. So the government is probably trying to control things through purchase restrictions in China. Well, Winston, on that, um, are there are there moves though to to liberalize? Because there's a lot of reform measures that the Chinese government has said they will undertake, um, not necessarily because of pressure, but it is a natural way of evolving a, a market. Uh, do you foresee that is coming to my my guess? Understanding was that you didn't, but I just wanted to ask you. Do you see that coming to the real estate at some point, where the foreigners will be able to come in and purchase these? Um, maybe not, because if you look at at on a price to income ratio, the the real estate prices in China are quite highly valued. Uh, because let's say, for instance, now prices in Shenzhen. Ah,、uh, for instance, not as expensive as Hong Kong, but is let's say, place like Shanghai, Shenzhen, ah,、uh, Beijing. The prices are comparable to prices in Australia, very similar. But of course, the average income level is much lower than, ah,、uh, Australia. But of course, you have a lot more rich people in China from different parts of China buying properties in Shanghai and Beijing. So unless they control things, they will have social problems. So it's not a It's not a market issue; it's a social problem. So they they haven't gone as far as Singapore, where you know Singapore the the housing sector is dominated by the government by 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 state housing, which is high quality. But places like Shenzhen, because of certain you know dynamics in China, which we don't have time to go to, that the government cannot、uh, allow a completely liberalized market in order to maintain social stability. Thank you very much. I want to turn to the audience again. I know some people have come in、uh, in the middle, but if you want to make a comment or、uh, direct a question, please feel free to do so. We're entering our last five minutes、um, with the distinguished panel, and we did talk about a lot of things, macro level, micro level, on this very issue. Okay, I'm on the record for inviting the the audience for the second time. So、uh, feel free to jump in,、uh, but I want to ask one other question, and that's a controversial question. We talked about the、uh, monetary aspect of the crisis. We talked about、uh, responses from the government, but we did talk about money. We didn't talk about power. And I want to ask、uh, the audience and the panelists as well: Do you think that the pandemic has helped some governments、uh, in extending their control? Uh, limiting democracy and、uh, advancing their own agendas.、Uh, I, I don't want to ask this question, but I think it's an inevitable one because of the things that we're hearing and seeing. So, what is the、uh, the thinking on that? And you can just get started, whoever wants. But, so, Russell here. Well, this is a very emotional debate in the UK at the moment,、um, uh, almost to sort of conspiracy theory levels. You know that、uh, big tech. Uh, big pharma as、uh, uh, benefiting so much from from the、uh, domestic challenge that something's not quite right,、um, and then of course the all the use of the data, personal data, movements,、um, the track and trace technology which we need to keep us safe. Now,、um, what what are the consequences of that、uh, going forward?、Um, and in the UK. Uh, for many years, the concept of a digital identity or an identity card has been、um, ruled out. In fact, it's 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 not allowed. So it would not in in part in our laws to have an identity card.、Um, but the growing clamour for some form of digital identity to you know to ease transactions to reduce fraud. Um, at an individual and a corporate layer with legal entities identifiers, so that clamour is beginning to build.、Um, 
many of us, including me, feel we should be investing and creating that type of uh, security and authentication or for transactions or for positive reasons. Um, uh, but the public sector needs to decide and the government needs to decide the the strength and, and in, uh, invasion of privacy, which is, is a, uh, a big concern of many, many Brits. Thank you. I uh, just make a brief statement uh, because now is a rush. I just want to let it red mark appear green saying, there's two minutes left, so I don't know if we're going to get disconnected or tonight, but I want to do that. May, may I speak on someone? Yes. Sure. So, sure. So, very briefly, I just come back from um, a week of holiday in China. And, and now in China, when you travel, either take a plane or high-speed train or even enter into an attraction, just tap your ID card. So there's no train tickets anymore. It's your ID card, is it? And even going to choose attraction, you have ID card. Now, so the, the, the government will know exactly where you are, when you are. Now, but that is partly, you know, if there is a, another COVID outbreak, they can trace exactly all the people. They can trace exactly where people come from who will be affected. So those are the, the flip side of privacy and the big brother. So now, even last week, there was... A lot of travel is very crowded before all that is now. A lot of people are all traveling throughout China, perhaps safely, but at the price that they're giving up their privacy. They are being, they could be monitored all the time. Thank you. Any last comments from, from the panelists? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good time to be an autocrat because um, you... In an environment where nobody knows anything and there is tremendous uncertainty, the human brain is not designed to cope with that very well. So unverifiable information said by people in power with conviction and vigor tends to work very well in the near term. And, um, you know, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the nature of the beast. And incidentally, lest we think that we're facing new here on that front, we've seen this a, a hundred times over the past 500 years. There's nothing new here, nada. Well, thank you very much. I don't want to finish on that note, but that's, that, is very <laughs> that is very powerful and I agree with it. But I, want to thank, I want to thank the panelists. 45 minutes is just not enough to, to talk about an issue like this. But I really do appreciate your contributions. Uh, we did talk about the monetary aspect. We did talk about fiscal aspect. We even moved on to talk about um, how democracies at, at certain points are challenged because of what we're facing. Um, hopefully, looking ahead, uh, we're going to be able to move monetarily and fiscally together. We're going to be able to bring the people who are down a little further up uh, and uh, kind of not maybe completely resolve the problem, but alleviate the the impacts that uh, that we have felt uh, to the point that right here we are, um, instead of being together, we're just uh, addressing these issues uh, from our laptops in our offices or living rooms. I thank you again very much, uh, fellow panelists and uh, the audience. Hopefully uh, you had an entertaining um, back and forth here and presentations and uh, hopefully everybody will enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.